Welcome to Two Cents Sharp. We're a couple of trumpet players who sort through the best and worst of the online trumpet community, so you don't have to. Then we give our two cents. It's time for another full interview from this episode cycle. Today we'll hear our conversation with emerging leader Abby Temple. From the Piedmont of North Carolina, Boston-based trumpeter and visual artist Abby Temple is passionate about chamber music, orchestral performance, early music, and the intersection of music and art. She is a co-founder of Chroma Collective, a trumpet duo that combines music and visual art in engaging performances and promotes composers from underrepresented backgrounds. Abby currently serves as co-principal trumpet with the Du Bois Orchestra in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And as a soloist, she recently performed a program of her own artistic connections and improvisations titled Color, Intuition, Sound. In the trumpet community, she is a founder of the first International Trumpet Guild student group designed to connect young trumpet players throughout the United States and beyond. Abby holds a Bachelor of Music in Music Performance from the University of Kentucky and is currently pursuing her master's degree at the Longy School of Music in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she serves as a teaching assistant in Longy's LC Stemma program and studies with Ashley Hall and Andy Kozar. Hi, Abby. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Where are we talking to you from? So I'm in Hickory, North Carolina right now. And that's yeah. where you grew up, or yeah, that's okay. where I'm from. I grew up in this house. Oh, fantastic! Well, it's great to see you. We haven't talked since the Grand Valley International Trumpet Seminar back in like 2015, or yeah, 2015. So it's in been six years. Yeah, a wow. hot minute. <laughs> yeah, that was my first trumpet seminar that I ever went to. Mine too. Nine, it was three. it was great. I remember we bonded over our mutual complete confusion over what the heck was going on. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know anyone there except for Chase Hawkins. And he was on the faculty. Yeah. So it's yeah, definitely I've... a different beast. <laughs> <laughs> I flew to Michigan. That was my first time ever flying. And I didn't know anyone except for him. So I was also very confused. <laughs> well, I'm glad it ended up being a good experience for you. I remember having a lot of fun that week. Yeah, that that just like completely opened up my world to what being a trumpet performer was because before that, I didn't even know you could perform as a career. Well, something we like to start off all of our interviews with is asking, uh, why did you start playing the trumpet? So I started in seventh grade and it was kind of later than a lot of other people I know. But our middle school started in seventh grade, and my dad played trumpet when he was in middle school. So he was like, why don't you just play this instrument that we already have so Hmm. we don't have to buy anything new? And I just stuck with it. You didn't want to play another instrument? You just kind of jumped right on the trumpet game? (laughs) I, I wanted to play saxophone or drums. But then once he like handed me the trumpet, I was really interested in the valves. Oh yeah. <laughs> what made you want to pursue it professionally? Mm, yeah, well, definitely going to the GVSU seminar. And cause so before that I'm like, well, I can be a band director cause I love this so much. I've never loved anything more than playing music. And I guess I'll teach high school. But then at the GVSU seminar, I saw all these people that were doing it professionally and coming from different countries into Michigan. Like, whoa, I really want to travel and I want to perform and I want to like go all over the world with this. That's great. Yeah, I love that. And you're a very active person in starting important conversations, I think, with the trumpet community. What's your favorite part of the trumpet community? There's so many things. <laughs> I've been thinking about it all morning and definitely meeting people our, around our age. It's great meeting people kind of in our age group who have been through this same or similar experiences as us. Yeah. It's nice to know you're not alone or weird or anything. There, there's some <laughs> sort of like connecting thread that you find with all trumpet players, even if it's like jazz versus classical or whatever. There's so many differences with trumpet players, but we all face like the same enemy that is being oboes. And so like, 
And so we all kind of share this kinship, and especially when you're talking with or spending time with other trumpeters in the same demographic, mm -hmm. you, you find like an even deeper bond that kind of goes beyond just being human. Yeah, I think we all have a lot in common, especially with our personalities. I think there's definitely a level of confidence you have to have mm -hmm. as a trumpet mm -hmm. player since we can crack a note and everyone hears it. So we have to have this confidence that we're okay with that. And all trumpet players that I know are really fun to be around. What is something you think the trumpet community could work on and how do you think we should approach it? So like this past, the past two years, me and Madison Barton kind of started this ITG student group and it's a group on Facebook and we have an Instagram, but it's mainly trying to get everyone our age together and talking because we found that with every conference that we went to, no one would really talk to each other. And mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I always tried my best to make connections, whether that's at NTC or ITG, but it was never really like fostered. Oh, certainly. I, I did notice that I've only ever gone to one ITG conference and really people just kind of stuck with the groups they already came with. Right. <laughs> and there was like a feeling of competition more than kinship amongst everybody. And then there were like the people who were just coming because they liked trumpet, not because it was yeah. a career thing. And those people were always just like off in their own little world and walking yeah. around and listening. So I absolutely love that you took this approach of opening up the discussions amongst all of us trumpet players. And I, I've seen a lot of really thought provoking questions in that group. And that's definitely part of why we wanted to have you on this podcast is <laughs> we, we see you, we see the good you're trying to do and we love oh it. <laughs> yeah. And so part of this ITG student group is, so it's a private Facebook group. And the only requirements are that you have to be a trumpet player and a student. So I don't know what will happen next year because I won't be a student anymore. Um, <laughs> Not but... me still in that group. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are kind of like hiding in there, but it's, it's fun. Um, but the best thing that's came out of it, I think, is we host these video chats on Zoom. And throughout the pandemic, we'll have several different Zoom calls, either every week, every other week, once a month, and around 10 people join each time. And that's like been a great way to make connections while we can't see each other in person. That sounds really cool. And that, that definitely encourages the connections like outside of just the groups you work within. I, I love that you've had these video chats to kind of open up your minds and discuss various things about trumpet or just get to know each yeah. other. Yeah. It, it's fun because most of the time we don't talk about trumpet when we're in those hangs. <laughs> wow. Going off to completely unrelated tangents. But we did have a meeting where we like made a plan. We're going to talk about what we want to see for our future trumpet community. And we talked for like maybe three hours wow. that night. <laughs> that sounds super cool. Yeah, and I don't know if you know David Aguila, but he I has like heard tons name. of ideas about where we can take this. Oh, that sounds like a future podcast guest. Oh, yeah. yeah, you'll definitely want to have him. Well, as trumpeters working in the public arena, it's considered part of the job to be ambassadors, stewards, representatives of the arts to the general <laughs> community, not just the trumpeters. What do you say about this obligation we have and what do you do to contribute as a representative of music to non-music people? Well, I think a big part of that is playing anywhere we can, anytime we can, whether that's like in a church service. I think that's a huge part because a lot of those people are familiar with music because of all the hymns and everything, but they get to experience even more when more musicians come in. I don't know, and make, making concerts accessible to everyone and not making it as formal. Definitely. Absolutely. I've seen a lot of street performances or just yeah. playing from my living room and in my street clothes, just broadcasting <laughs> to the internet. That's, that's definitely how I did my master's recital is just, I didn't dress yeah. up at all. It was just, I looked like, kind of like a DJ. 
it's certainly still fun to do the formal concerts, but I, I absolutely love the ideas that a lot of us have been having, especially during the pandemic of just getting comfortable and enjoying music for what it is, not for the pomp and circumstance of it. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I recently started a group with my friend Holland Slykeis, and it's called the Chroma Collective. And it's just a trumpet duo right now, but we combine music and visual art and performance with the goal that we want the audience to feel like they're artists too. Ooh, and so they that. don't have to have any experience with music or with art. And yeah, the idea is to get them making art while we're playing. It sounds like a neat twist on the same ideas of like the Disney Fantasia kind of thing where they're just trying to connect something outside of just the audio experience of music trying to open up the mind to different forms of enjoyment of music i love that idea yeah i i also have always had this like deep connection with visual art and music and i i sometimes feel when i see something along with what i'm hearing i can remember it a lot better really any good teacher will at least touch on having visualizations for music mm -hmm. with their students that's such an important part of enjoying music is being able to connect to it at a level outside of just how you hear it. Yeah, for sure. Whether that's through like hearing different colors or I like to think of brush strokes along with phrases. That is a really Never thought of it that way. That is a very wonderful way of thinking of it. I mean, I've com I've compared music to language in a way where like phrases are sentences, notes are words and such, but I've never considered it like painting a picture. That's a really unique way of looking at it. Yeah, it, it keeps it fun and more interesting. <laughs> wow. For sure. So when you are working in a field like music, um, you have a lot of opportunities to be a leader, both with your colleagues and with people who aren't as experienced. Um, how do you approach being a leader in the trumpet community? I think like really advocating for what we do, like music is worthwhile. It's very satisfying. A huge part of being a musician is that it is for everyone. For sure. Yeah. No matter what your skill is or level of talent, it's something that you can always work on and get better at. And it's a lifelong pursuit, so you're never going to reach perfection. Anyone can do it, and if you really, like, have the passion to do it, then you should. Definitely. Certainly. Yeah. And that, that's what we want to encourage is, you know, the people with the passion for music should feel safe and encouraged in their journey to continue improving as musicians. For a long time, I've thought if I were to ever get a, give a master class and I had just to pick one topic, Mm -hmm. I, it'd be the topic of if you want to do it you can do it you just yeah. have to do it yeah and like especially since this past year it's really made me think like do I really want to do this this is kind of horrible right now yeah <laughs> oh yeah have any concerts no audiences I can't meet any new people like those are the main things I love about making music and they all got taken away Oh, it's been definitely interesting to watch the age of digital music change with the pandemic because I had, I mean, tons of artists that were like, I'm never going to have an online presence suddenly were online and people who never play in trumpet ensembles or who never wanted to do like virtual ensembles are suddenly doing virtual ensembles mm -hmm. because really when it comes down to it, you do what you can to maintain that connection to music. No matter what. No matter what, yeah. Well, do you have any words of advice for new trumpeters? Or trumpeters returning to the horn after a super long break? <laughs> I kind of feel like that right now, that I'm coming back to it after a super Me long break. Me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, took, I definitely distanced myself from the trumpet in the, after my master's recital. I was just like, all right, I'm just going to ride this burnout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And only in the past, like, couple weeks have I found myself practicing on a consistent basis. Me, me too. Um, and I think, like, a great piece of advice is to play music that you love. Oh, my goodness. And Every single person. Really? <laughs> and that yeah. is the one piece of advice that has kept me practicing. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that. Like, of course I love the trumpet. Like, 
I know I can play, but if I'm not working on something, mm -hmm. for, especially not for any sort of attainable goal, like there's not a lot of concerts or auditions, well, auditions are picking up, but I'm not taking them yeah. right now, then what am I doing? I'm practicing in circles, so mm -hmm. I might as well play something I love and have a good time. Yeah, exactly. And then I can worry about getting better. Well, how do you apply that in, in your own practice, playing what you love? Well, like this past year, I've been at the Longy School of Music with Ashley Hall and Andy Kozar, and they're both really encouraging me to be the musician I want to be. And I came in like the first week thinking, I'm going to play the Tomasi concerto mm -hmm. this semester. And then Andy was like, do you really want to play that? I'm like, well, I guess I don't really want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Just feel like I have to play it because that's one of these things that every trumpet player does. So then I was thinking, well, what do I actually want to play? I love Piazzolla. I love Cafe 1930. I love Arben solos. I love pop music. And every time people ask me, like, what music are you listening to right now? It's always pop music and, <laughs> and rap and not really classical music. And so I'm starting to incorporate that to playing that kind That's of music. Great. I love that. Not enough people incorporate the music they enjoy listening to into the music they enjoy playing. Like there's there's a few weirdos out there like myself who like genuinely the thing that I listen to is the classical music and that's <laughs> what I go to. But I don't think there's many, especially not in the professional field, many trumpet players who are exclusively or almost exclusively listening to classical music. Yeah. They're, they exist, but... They exist, but they're <laughs> I don't they're think they are many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, I think one really great example of who plays music that they love is Jerome Burns. He is around our age, and he posts videos of himself covering Me Sugar songs. <laughs> that and sounds like so much fun. <laughs> incredible. And he, he loves it so much, you can tell. Yeah, I love it. Really, when you perform, it's not just the performance you're putting out. It's also, you know, the audience can tell, are you going for it and are you enjoying it? And if you aren't going fit for it or enjoying it, the, the, I don't, the whole energy of the groove just immediately drops. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I love watching people play what they love to play. Yeah. yeah. Even if they're in middle school, you know, like if you're that age, you can play music that you love. Oh, yeah. Um, so do you have any like funny stories from rehearsals or lessons or anything really? So I've done some different things outside of playing trumpet. Like at one moment I was really interested in music theory. And so I went to the Queens College boot camp for musicology and theory. And I was super excited. It was in New York and it was just one week and everyone was like, they were either string players or pianists and no one wanted to hang out. Oh. No one wanted to like get drinks at the end of the day. Oh. <laughs> and it made me really miss brass players. Oh yeah. There's definitely a pub culture in brass players. Oh, <laughs> There's something about our community that just makes it really fun. Oh, yeah. I know. I love playing music. I definitely think that, like, some of the most fun I've ever had, and this is not, like, necessarily an endorsement for alcohol in general, but, like, <laughs> just to clarify for those who are not yet in drinking age, but, I mean, just spending that time in a truly casual environment with a lot of brass players is really fun. And we, we did that in trumpet seminar, but... I don't remember if you were part of the group, but we would like gather around the Papa John's on campus and the store itself was actually closed. So we had them deliver to like right outside the door. Yeah, huh. yeah, I, I was there for that. Too. Yeah, and we were just like enjoying ourselves in a casual environment as trumpet players who are talking about non-trumpet things. And that's that's definitely like, I absolutely love those those occasions. Yeah, I miss it so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Any like words of advice or tokens of wisdom from your time as a trumpet player that you'd like to kind of tell the world? I have one more thing. <laughs> I was thinking about our lineage. I think you might have mentioned this earlier and our connections 
that we make between trumpet players. And I think it's so important to remember where we come from and where it's going from us. So like going to the GVSU seminar, I only went there because of Chase Hawkins. And I met him at a master class in South Carolina. My teacher, Tim Phillips, brought me there. And it, Ed Carroll was teaching. And I was 15 or 16. And so I met Chase there. And then Chase brought me to GVSU, which brought me to the University of Kentucky. And that just went like exponential opportunities from there. But Ed, Ed Carroll was talking to me that even before that master class, that event where I met him, it went way back. And he's like, did you know this connection goes all the way back to Arnold Jacobs? And wow. so what happened was my teacher, Tim Phillips, his teacher was John Sizemore, which is a euphonium player. He just passed away this past year. Oh. And Ed Carroll and John Sizemore were best friends in Chicago because John Sizemore took the place of Arnold Jacobs in the brass quintet, the Chicago brass quintet. Yeah. So it reaches all the way back to Arnold Jacobs. And I just can't imagine like where it'll go from now and how many other people this whole lineage will affect. I've never considered trumpet as a genealogy, but it really is like that. I mean, we have the trumpet players who teach trumpet players who then go on to influence and teach and it just goes on and on and we all have our own connections to just yeah. the great influential trumpet players of the past and we will be influencing trumpet players in the future so mm -hmm. it's something we have to keep in mind as we play it's not just about us right here right now but it's also where we're going yeah <laughs> that makes me think like even though trumpet seems like there's a stereotype of being very egotistical, this reminds us that it's way more than just ourselves. Way yeah. bigger than ourselves. It is, it, and it always has been. Yeah. Well, do you have uh, any upcoming projects or projects in the work you'd like to speak about? I, I know you mentioned the Chroma Collective and, oh, yeah. of yeah. course, the, the student group that you may or may not stay in once you're no longer a student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so with the Chroma Collective, we're trying to do more concerts at elementary schools and really get the younger kids involved in art and music. I love that. It, fostering those connections at a young age, it's, it's crucial. Um, I would not have been so excited to join band. I was already playing violin. I would not have been so excited if they hadn't brought in band instrumentalists <laughs> to like mm -hmm. show what it's like to play in an ensemble and then that continues on so those connections they start at a young age yeah and especially at that age you remember things a lot better too oh certainly certainly well it's been so so wonderful to have you on yeah, and thank, thank you so much for chatting about trumpet and all the little fun stuff with us it was you nice know to i always love to talk about trumpet so this is good <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Abby, for your time and thoughts. It was so much fun talking with you. Tune in next week for the third and final interview from this episode cycle. We'll be hearing from Sarah Jessen, and then we'll begin another cycle of episodes. You can reach Abby online at www.abbytemple.com, and listeners can find links to her Facebook and Instagram on the website. The intro music is Night, a piece written by Abby Temple, and the emerging leader's music is St. Sans the Swan. Thanks for listening, and remember, always play two cents sharp. <laughs>